am Linda van Tolberg. Professor James Larkin and his team at the University of the Witwatersrand in South Africa has found a novel way to save rhinos, which are still being poached at a frightful rate due to demand in the East. It's called the Rhizotape Project and it uses nuclear technology, which can be picked up by radiation detection monitors at international borders. And with me in the studio is Professor James Larkin from Wits. Hi, Prof. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for having me on your program and your, your interview, I suppose, is perhaps the right way. What you came up with is, you know, something really interesting that might actually work. So how does it work? Um, it works on two particular fronts, to be honest with you. First of all, we use people's natural aversion to radioactive materials. So we put a small quantity into the horn, tell the world, hey, look, rhino horn from Southern Africa is going to be radioactive now. And we rely upon people's, you know, fear of radiation to, you know, scare them away and, and to realise that the horn's no longer valuable. And, you know, let's leave it on the on the horns of, of the rhino. You know, if there's no value in the horn, then there's less poaching. But on the second, you know, string of this process is by making the horn slightly radioactive, it becomes easier to detect these horns as it's moved from one part of the world to another. Um, as it crosses international borders, goes through airports, harbours and things like that, because we've chosen just the right quantity to go into the horn that won't harm the animals, but it's just enough to set off these detectors. And when the detectors go off, there are the standard operating procedures in place, because these detectors were and have continued to be put in to prevent nuclear terrorism. So we piggyback on the back of that, and there's a system in place, there's the training in place, there's a much larger team of people now who are capable of detecting rhino horn. So we've gone from a couple of hundred people in the world to quite a few thousand people in the world capable of um, intercepting these horns. So how did you come up with this idea? One of those three o'clock in the morning type thoughts, I think. It, I, I've been approached to say, could we make horn you know, radioactive to poison people? And I said, no, because... Quite frankly, I don't want to go to prison. Um, uh, but, you know, lying in bed one night, I thought, well, hang on a minute. I have this set of skills in nuclear security education and an understanding of radiation protection because I've been doing these things for many years and realized that we've got these systems in place. Well, then maybe we could use them. And so kind of set about thinking about the idea and, yeah, there was a number of years worth of research has gone into this to realize and identify what is the correct quantity, what's the correct type of radioisotope, where we put it in the horns, and to make sure, obviously, that we don't harm the animals. So, you know, that, that, that's that been my life since 2019, pretty much, is to get to the position now where we're nearly ready to say to the world, here we are, we're ready to come and treat your rhinos. Well, you've been testing this. Um, is it ready to roll out, you know, worldwide? Very early. I'm, we're planning to roll out beginning of July. I'm, there are a couple of step, small steps that need to be taken just to make sure everything is hunky-dory and all, you know, we, we've done the science, we've done the research, we're waiting for the last results to come in on some work that we've done. Um, we've got a very good collaboration now with the regulator who's been, you know, you know, they, they had their concerns, but we took them up to go and see the rhinos and answered all of their concerns. And now we've just got to dot the I's, cross the T's and make sure, you know, all of that's done. And then we should be ready come July to roll it out. We've already had, today I had an inquiry from Botswana asking if they could have their rhinos treated. So, um, yeah, we're ready pretty much. Is yeah. this the silver bullet we've been looking for? I hesitate to claim it as a silver bullet because I think that would be too arrogant. I see it as a powerful tool in the toolbox along with the dedicated um, anti-poaching rangers, the, um, the tech that's been put into place, the hard work and goodwill of the owners. Um, so it's an addition to all of the, what we in the security world, they call the guns, guards, gates and geeks. And this is just another, I think, big hefty tool that's going to help. Is it enough of a deterrent, do you think? 
I think so. I've, I've spent my last number of years um, believing this. I, I spent perhaps, well, I've been working in radiation protection now for nearly 30 years. Um, in that time, I've tried to convince people that radiation is a useful tool and it's not something to be feared, and I fail catastrophically. So let me use that failure and turn it on its head and use that particular fear of people to um, be able to you know, turn them away from wanting to own rhino horn as a demonstration of fabulous wealth. Is it safe for the rhinos? Yes. I put my hand on my heart and say, yes, it is safe for the rhinos. Um I've done the work and independently we, we, we're working with a number of other universities globally, Texas A&M and Colorado State. They independently created their own model of the head of a rhino. They ran their own software. Um, I did the same here in South Africa. Um, you know, working again, having that work, if you like, assessed by a colleague at Colorado State University and our calculations were very similar. So... Um, we believe what we've calculated and what we've tested and what we've now shown in situ in the field. Um, no, the doses to the animals are not dangerous. It's about two to three CT scans to the head of the human. That's the equivalent dose that each rhino will get each year. So it, it's, yes, it's a dose, but it's, it's um, not going to harm these animals. So what happened to these isotopes if a rhino dies? Well, we hope, naturally. Um, what happens to those rhinos? We, we will retrieve the horns and then put them into safekeeping. You know, okay. yes, so, there are established rules and regulations as to what happens to horn and what happens to radioisotopes. And, you know, we very carefully worked out with the, the regulators what will be done with these horns. About detection at airports, so how many, you know, do all airports have this? And is there an issue maybe of these horns not going through regular airports, harbours? There are about 11,000 detection systems spread around the globe. Um, so the chances of horns not going through at least one detection system are really quite slim, to be honest with you, because, mm. yes, obviously the horns might be smuggled out of southern Africa. But at some point between Southern Africa and the Far East, where the end users are, those horns have to get into the formal transport system, whether they're put into containers, put into suitcases, put into air freight, anything like that. There are these detectors there that have been put into place for quite a few years now, since, you know, last 20 or 30 years, they, they have been installing and upgrading and expanding this system. And... It's, you know, always has been for nuclear terrorism, but we're very grateful that this, this is all going on. And um, we were extraordinarily lucky to work with the Customs and Border Protection um, people at, in New York at JFK Airport and at Newark Harbour and to test their systems, which are some of the older systems, but we were setting off the detectors all over the place with the quantity of radioactive material we put planning to put into the horns of more rhinos. So... We, we've tested it theoretically. We've tested it practically. It works. So, um, how many? How big is this problem still of a, a rhino poaching? Can you just can you just outline, give us some numbers? Um, in the Kruger National Park, since the beginning of the year, they have lost thirty five animals already, and they are oh. now starting to poach animals that are, they've already. There's a process called dehorning or horn trimming, which is mm. done to try and protect these animals, and poachers are now starting to target some of these animals as well. Um, so, you know, dehorning is for... It's it's the option of last resort, and, I'm so, and I'm, unfortunately, I don't think it's working now. Um, the numbers nationally... I, I, I just saw an article, I haven't read it yet, published today talking about the numbers of animals poached last year but to be honest with you um if it's going the same rate it has done for the last few years then the number the numbers of animals poached each year is, is going to go up even if it stays the same the, the you know the, the 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 poaching rate if it increases by a fraction of percent we're going to start then seeing a, a collapse in rhino population numbers 
So what is your background? Why this interest in nuclear technology? Oh, my background. Well, I, I'm an Africa boy. I was born in Kenya many years ago. Um, grew up, you know, have it. I've got rose tinted memories of you know traveling in Kenya and seeing to going to the Mara Game Reserve and places mm -hmm. like that, and Savo National Park, up to Mount Elgin and places. Um, I uh, my first degree was in biology. My next one is in physics. So I've been working in radiation protection for very, very nearly 30 years. I'm working in nuclear security since the 2010 World Cup here in South Africa. And mm. look, I mean, it was that story, oh, somebody should do something about the poaching. And that little kind of worm in your ear saying, well, maybe, Larkin, it's you. You, you, you might be able to do something about it. And I have been extraordinarily fortunate to then attract a number of people to come and work with me on the project and open doors for me um and they've believed in this project which is sometimes can be a lot of pressure on the shoulders because you know we've got having gone from an idea on a piece of paper to going to see owners of rhinos and say could i please do some research on your animals and the person turn around and saying yes and you, you kind of your jaw drops because you know these are endangered animals but these people mm. are suitably open-minded enough to say yeah we like what you're talking about we, we like the idea we're prepared to let you do some initial research on on you know, on these animals and then we we met mr harry van deventer who runs the rhino orphanage in limpopo and he said yeah you can come and do run the pilot project on our item on you know 20 of our animals here um we i believe this is very much worthwhile doing so again a little bit more pressure on the shoulders and you know the, the, the some sleepless nights with it but having done the work i firmly believe and you know along with the proof from my colleagues at texas a and m and colorado state that we're not going to do any harm to these animals and we think this is a viable option to try and help protect these animals Wow, Professor James Larkin. Well, good luck with that, you know, Thank and saving you these absolutely, absolutely majestic animals. Yeah, no, I, this, uh, the collaboration I have received from my colleagues at the Nuclear Energy Corporation here in South Africa, Texas A and M, it's just been extraordinary. You know, I, I've approached these organisations and say, look, I've got this idea. Can you help? And you can see them sort of mentally rolling their sleeves up, even before I've finished asking the question and saying. And then, you know, that, that's been something here in South Africa, well, globally, to be honest with you, is, yeah, how can we help? You know, a comment from my friend in Colorado, in Texas, was, you know, it's not often you get the chance to try and save a species. <laughs>